Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, this is part two of a four-part series that we have organized as the Guggenheim Museum with our partner in this endeavor for freedoms. I'm Syra Levinson. I'm the Deputy Director and Gail Engelberg, Director of Education and Public Engagement at the museum. On behalf of the museum, I wish to share that we look forward to a future dialogue with the Lenny Lenape peoples on protocols for a fulsome and land acknowledgement. Until then, and on behalf of the museum, I recognize that we stand on Manahata, traditional territory of the Lenape nation. I also wanna call your attention to the fact that I'm joined today on the screen, as will my colleagues in our panel discussion by Amber Brathwaite. Uh, Amber is an American sign language interpreter and a Dakota descendant. We are immensely grateful to our colleagues at Four Freedoms for introducing us to today's panelists. We believe that the future of art museums, in fact, depends on reckoning with the topics of today's conversation and hence the title of our panel. I thank you deeply to our panelists for your expertise, your knowledge and your willingness to share your thoughts and your honest feedback on issues of indigenous people's rights, cultural protection and restorative justice in this context. I also extend my gratitude to the family of Elaine Turner Cooper for their generous support of programming at the Guggenheim and for making this series possible. A little bit about our partners. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Four Freedoms is a community of artists and thinkers, and also a platform that fosters creative and civic engagement, discourse, and direct action. You might be familiar with their work on billboards, uh, in conferences, and panel discussions, and at museums across the country. The Four Freedoms are freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of worship, and freedom of speech. This is a moment both in our institution and in our country where those themes resonate deeply. And today we welcome an open dialogue with all who join us. It's now my pleasure to welcome Michelle Wu, one of the founders of Four Freedoms for some brief remarks before she turns the conversation over to our panelists. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you so much, Syra. Um, for that beautiful introduction. Um, hi everyone, I'm Michelle Wu. I am one of the co-founders of Four Freedoms. I am greeting you today from Tongva land and want to recognize all of the original peoples whose land I stand upon. Um, I am Chinese American with long black hair, freckles and a floral top. It is with great honor to help introduce our second program with the Guggenheim and curator Jody Archambeau, our friend and collaborator. Jody is an artist, organizer, and strategic advisor at the Bush Foundation. She is also the director of Indigenous Peoples Initiatives at One Collective and previously served in critical leadership positions for Native American affairs under the Barack Obama administration. As you know, Four Freedoms believes in the vital role of culture in transforming our political system, and that creativity can help us to find our voices and harness them for abundant transformation. Lately, we have spent a lot of time meditating on how we engage and collaborate in order to be in service to all communities and practice our core values of healing, listening, and justice. Thank you so much again to Jody, Suzanne, America, Natalie, and Edgar, who will hopefully join us for their incredible work and visions for the future. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Today's a good day. I greet you with a heartfelt handshake. My name is Jody Archambault and I'm a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I'm coming to you from Bismarck, North Dakota, homelands of the Mandan and Dakota people. I want to thank the Guggenheim Museum and Four Freedoms for inviting Suzanne Harjo and myself to co-curate this event and bring you this conversation today. I also want to thank Edgar Heap of Birds for in the cover art listing Bear Butte first for this 
for this panel today's cover art is a piece by Edgar Heapaford. And this sacred place that uh, we call Bear Buttes or Khesapa is also called um, Mato Paha in Lakota. And I am something just happened with my screen. So I just want to say that we're going to be talking in the show about the reckoning addressing indigenous people's rights, culture, protection, restorative justice for the Summer of No panel here at the Guggenheim Museum uh, Summer of No series. Um, but first, before we start, I want to acknowledge that today we're living in the time of reckoning live from the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the empty courts and playing fields of the American mainstay pacifier of professional sports. Not only are people taking to the streets of cities across the US, but athletes and sport com sports commentators are rejecting the fun and games that distract from the very fundamental issues of human rights, where anti-Black and anti-Indigenous systems of white supremacy reign with illusions of power. This racial terror is no longer acceptable. And so today, we start our journey for the next hour, understanding from several extraordinary artists and activists how art is critical to reimagining a radical future that is just and in harmony with the earth. How indigenous peoples have prayed and worked and created connections between dimensions of time and space, and especially how they are compelled to bring indigenous people's perspective and experience into places and institutions that have not always been open to our voices. My work is an example of this, Alan. I'm a Lakota woman and I grew up on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation where my grandmothers taught me to dance and make traditional clothing. In their honor and in honor of my own grandchildren, I made clothes that eventually made it into the Metropolitan Museum. This was in 2015 and for this, time, this was the first show that the Met had ever done to feature Native American art. And for that, 2015 was very late, but at the same time, it signals a change in how these institutions are, are shifting, albeit slowly. Thanks to Ryan Redcorn for the, the photo. Um, I, I think that these museums are shifting their views of Native Americans because you see for centuries, institutions like these, like the Met, like the Guggenheim, have perpetuated a narrative that not only have rendered Native Americans not human, but they also erased our existence in their stories of what they saw as significant. I'm setting up this conversation by saying that I believe the shift, shift is also happening here at the Guggenheim as well. The Guggenheim Museum still has not had any shows featuring Native American artists. That erasure is changing with today's program. In fact, they still have no art made by Native Americans in their collection. This time of reckoning is upon us and Susan and I have brought together individual Native American women and men to have a discussion about our rights as contemporary human beings. Our exper experiences and perspectives are welcomed by the Guggenheim. We have Suzanne Schoen Harjo, Edgar Heap of Birds, Natalie Stites Means, and America Meredith. The program will run where each of them will provide remarks and, some, and share some art and visuals. Then I'll ask each of them a question in the second, in the second round. I'll, bring, I'll talk a little about, a bit about our panelists right now. Natalie Stites Means, a Dakota Lakota is enrolled with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and was the first Native American woman to run for the mayor of Rapid City, South Dakota in 2019. She is the founder of the Hesapa Voter Initiative, a civic engagement initiative for the urban, urban, urban Indians in Rapid City, now focused on COVID community response since 2020 and November election. America Meredith of the Cherokee Nation is the publishing editor of First American Art Magazine and an art writer, critic, visual artist, and independent curator whose curatorial practice spans 27 years. Suzanne Schoenhardro, Cheyenne Hodogi Muskogee, 
is a writer, curator, and policy advocate, has developed landmark laws and led campaigns for Native rights and helped Indigenous peoples protect sacred places to recover over 1 million acres of lands. Honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama in 2014, she is a founder of the National Museum of American Indian, whose work began with the coalition in 1967 and continued until the NMAI and reparation laws were repatriation laws, we would hope reparation laws eventually, uh, repatriation laws were signed in 1989 to 1990. And then we'll have Edgar Heap of Birds if he can join us. And he is a multidisciplinary artist and advocate for indigenous communities worldwide while representing indigenous communities. His art focuses first on social justice and on the personal freedom to live with the tribal circle as an expressive individual. His work is held in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Walker Art Collection, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. Heap of, Birds, Heap of Birds has taught at Yale University, Rhode Island School of Design, University of Cape Town, and the University of Oklahoma. We'll start with comments from America Meredith. America. Thank you so much, Jody. And I won't name everyone's names, but I'm deeply honored to be in this incredibly wonderful group of people. And thank you to the Guggenheim for allowing us this time. Um, I come to you from the indigenous land of me, I own it, in Norman, Oklahoma, and it sits on the ancestral lands of the Wichita and the affiliated tribes. Like many tribes, there are many, many, many tribes, not just one, one group of people with a complex history. Um, I have been an artist in my life, but right now my passion is First American Art Magazine. So when they ask me for art images, I'm like, what? oh yeah, I did that. This is my passion and it is, um, I have many goals, but the main is uh, getting, expanding the conversation in a non-academic setting. So collectors, artists, the public can be part of that conversation because I think if we only have it, there's a lot of gatekeeping in the art world. There's a lot of elitism. I have zero interest in that. If the artists aren't part of the conversation, the collectors aren't part of the conversation, and if the public doesn't feel welcome to the conversation, then it's not a real conversation. So everyone who's turned off by the mainstream art world, native art world's friendly, we welcome you and we won't speak down to you. But, um, and I taught Native Art History at the Institute of American Indian Arts, which is terrifying. I went from Tierra del Fuego to Greenland. And I think it's kind of fascinating that the most southernmost and northernmost ethnic groups in the entire planet are indigenous peoples of the Americas. And my passion and goal is for spreading information about Native Art History because um, that is how our ancestors spoke to us. So I am Cherokee. We are very proud of our language, our writing system that was developed by Sequoia. Um, but before the early 19th century, we didn't have a writing system like so many other tribes. So the visual art and the songs and the dances, that is our history. These aren't decor. There's like layers and layers and layers of information. And I think it takes a lot to be able to go to indigenous worldviews. So I think the first thing for non-native people to understand is that the indigenous worldviews are different from each other and different from, so I might look like you, but we definitely think differently. Um, and I want our values to accompany our art. So that's what I'm really asking the public is like, each of these artworks are from an indigenous viewpoint, they're living, they're living things, they're seeds that grow our culture. So everything, the process, the materiality, these are all important. They're all part of the conversation. And um, yeah, I was like, oh no, I need a really quick intro, but um, I hope we'll be able to look at some of my art soon. Um, I think when you think of, yes. This is kind of encapsulates my entire like first year of teaching, but it's like, that there's such a myriad. And I think outsiders might get a little frustrated by how complex each tribe is and how we just have our own discrete worldviews and they're all different from each other. And I think there's a desire for us to like kind of get together, band together. It's like, we've been fighting 500 years of genocide and cultural repression that is not stopped. 
institutional racism and the institutional cultural oppression, it might take different guises now, and most of it might come from the economic factors and, you know, kind of corporate uh, culture, glo corporate global culture. But um, we are still fighting to keep our own distinct cultures and our own distinct languages, even if only one or two or no people speak our language, we still want to revive them and keep them alive. So they think that's really important. And this is really didactic. I know, um, you know, I've definitely been critiqued in art circles, um, you know, for kind of being illustrative and didactic. But I want people to understand that um, that no matter what tools are used and the tools are important, that the heart of the indigenous person is going to be the same. You know, that indig indigeneity and indigenous voices all come from a very sincere place and will be expressed in many, many different forms. And we, we're gonna use every tool available to us. Um, it was funny in grad school, um, all the critique seminars that I'm sure many of you have gone through and endured, everyone's like, well, you need to push it further. You need to push it further. And I was like, well, from an indigenous viewpoint, um, a critique of your artwork would be, it needs to be more centered. You need to be more centered. And I think a good way to conceptualize um, a tribe or a native community is as a cell, you know, like an amoeba with a nucleus or as a solar system, or, you know, for us, our dance um, circles are that way, where you have this core and then people rotate around the core. And I'm definitely in one of the peripheries of the core. I don't live with my own tribe. And when people are looking for who to talk to, think about where they are in that, in that schema, in the solar system or the cell of the tribe. What is their relationship with the tribe? Because I think that's an important thing. There's so much individualism wired into, hardwired into Western art. And being indigenous, having a, if you put a tribal affiliation to your name, you are answerable to that tribe. And so that, that collective identity is very difficult, I think sometimes for, um, you know, to parse with um, contemporary Western art. But I think um, luckily a lot of the work that really helps the interpretation of native arts has already been done by the feminist arts, feminist artists in the 1970s. And um, it might be frivolous. I mean, Jody brought up many points. I mean, I, I was watching the news last night and it's hard, it's hard right now. But um, representation is important. Thank you so much, America. Now we'll move to Suzanne Schoen Harjo. Suzanne, when indigenous peoples look at reckoning, we look at historical accounting. And what does that mean to you? Well, in the first instance, it means place. It means especially sacred places. And one of them, we saw a slide briefly um, from a piece by Edgar Heap of Birds, here we go, that um, are the, the native names of places that are known by other names, Mount Chasta, Mount Rainier, and other such. Uh, what the top one is Noaus, which is Holy Mountain in Cheyenne. And Jody already told you what it was it, and is in Lakota. It's a sacred place to not only the Cheyenne and the Lakota, but also to the Arapaho, to at one point, we, we counted nearly 60 different native nations that had some religious ties to in the long history of Bear Butte, which is what it's called in English. It's now, a, it, it is, um, it's a place of healing. It always was. It's a place where birds come, birds stop there, red-tailed hawks and eagles stop there and owls stop there, lots of animals stop there and our people stop there. 
lots of insects, lots of flying creatures. Um, what on my Muscogee side, I'm a Cheyenne citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes in Oklahoma. And I'm also Hodogi Muscogee from Nuyaka ceremonial ground. Uh, and my citizenry is, is Cheyenne. Our people own part of Bear Butte, a very small part of it, and the first parcel that was returned to Native peoples as part of the first year's implementation of the 1978 American Indian Religious Freedom Act. And I was so privileged to have been placed in the right place at the same time, at the right time in the Carter administration as a political appointee. And I got to um, organize the return of, of a parcel of land that a white man farmer or Veha, as we say in Cheyenne, uh, which means spider, doesn't mean white, although it has come to uh, mean white uh, or be used as that, but it means spider because a great prophet of ours said that he overlaid the, um, that the Veha, the spider came here and overlaid a web, a giant web, and it is enmeshing us all. And if you look at, at an aerial view of anywhere USA, you see that from the utility lines to the highways, to the mines, to everything you can possibly think of, the railroad tracks, all of these things that were not here before Sweet Medicine prophesied that they would come. He said, this man will come and um, that will be his legacy and we must not give in to it. We must always be the Cheyennes. We have to always maintain who we are and our individuality. In the era of boarding schools, uh, my Cheyenne and Muscogee parents were put together and fell in love. And uh, I was the result of that and my brothers and we're happy for it. The federal government says you can only be a citizen of one nation. So this is instructive to people who don't understand how we are native. Your political nation to nation, that's Cheyenne nation to the United States, Cheyenne Arapaho tribes to the United States. That's all one thing. Uh, that's a political relationship and individually, our relationship is as citizens to, to that nation, to those nations. So I just wanted to clarify that so that people uh, understand when I apologize for not stressing my Muscogee relatives in this particular presentation, uh, except to say, Stango Stachati. Um, I'm happy today. Our Cheyenne relatives instruct us, our Cheyenne places instruct us. Every creature of the sacred, every creature of creation instructs us. And what we want very simple, land back, water back, people back. Does it mean everything? No, it means acre by acre and bucket by bucket if you have to. And sometimes you're fortunate enough to be able to get 300,000 acres back. Uh, that happens once in a blue moon, but sometimes it does happen and that's to the good. I wanted to raise up the name of Chief Starving Bear, Lean Bear, who was my mother's grandfather's 
my mother's grandmother's grandfather, older brother. He was, and her direct descendant was Bull Bear, Chief Bull Bear, the younger brother of this man you see here. This is taken by Matthew Brady, the famous Civil War pho photographer around the time, the same day, 27th of March, 1863, of the unwritten treaty amongst the Southern Plains nations, chiefs, and the American president, Abraham Lincoln. It was very simple, no encroachment, control the white people. That was the plea of the Southern Plains nations. And we want new territory that won't have the land rushers and the and the gold rushers, the people with the gold in their eyes, we want new treaty land. And that came about eventually. What Lincoln wanted was everyone's neutrality in the Civil War. There's another photo of uh, two photos of Chief Lean Bear, who's seated um, on the front row to the far left next to Chief Warbonnet, also Cheyenne, and Chief Stanson Water. Within a year, within a year and a half from this meeting, all those three men and President Lincoln had been murdered by white supremacists. So I am in great solidarity with everyone across the country who is in mourning today for what is happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Just take a moment here. It's a pretty tough a lot of people are in a place that doesn't seem like there's a lot of dark and a lot of light, I mean, and I uh, um, just want to thank you for that, for those words. I um, turned to Natalie Stites Means, um, a relative of mine and uh, somebody who I admire in her work. Um, in the near the sacred Black Hills, in the sacred Black Hills of South Dakota, Natalie. Hello, everybody. I'm so grateful to be joining you on this call and this discussion, this important conversation today. Um, I live in Rapid City here in the sacred Black Hills, um, and the political violence in the middle of South Dakota in the red state that we are is very real. And when I see what's happening in Kenosha today and for the past several days, I know that that could happen here and it could happen and it is happening throughout so many cities and towns and communities. Um, I don't want to discount that police brutality doesn't just happen in urban places or urban cities, urban areas, it happens whenever there is a police force. Um, I am a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe uh, in South Dakota. 11 years ago, I returned to South Dakota to help tribal people, to help my tribe. I have um, relatives almost at, uh, through every tribe here in South Dakota and throughout the Ocheti Shakoni homelands, um, which of course are much, uh, you know, from Wisconsin Dells to Wyoming uh, or to the Rockies in uh, Lakota thought and philosophy. Um, but certainly the 1868 treaty territory is something that is still valid and still controls our identities today and my identity. Uh, for the past 10 years, I uh, have worked in for tribal governments here in South Dakota I've also worked at the tech training and technical assistance level 
to assist tribes in their governmental programs and federal funding to address things like violence against women, violence against uh, children, uh, victims of crime, um, drug court, drug addiction, and those type of uh, legal and political and policy solutions to the conditions that are facing American Indian people. This work, uh, you know, uh, to I uh, have a Juris Doctor from the UCLA School of Law and I trained an apprentice to become a lawyer, um, but I did not become a lawyer. Um, and I think my training was preparing me for um, a world that just isn't reality. Um, I think that a veil is being lifted and a reality is being revealed that um, frankly, 20 years ago, um, these are conversations that indigenous people would have in their kitchens and in their homes and at their tables um, or even in our ceremonies. But we wouldn't say these things out loud that today are being spoken out loud. Um, and we need that. We need this injustice to be spoken of out loud. Um, last year when I ran for Rapid City Mayor, I was the first Native American woman to do so. And I did so as an act of resistance. It was not planned. Um, and it, I didn't run for political office the way that I thought I would. And I, 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 I just want to take a minute to acknowledge that both Jody and Suzanne are political role models. Um, I, I know they're their foot in the art world, but uh, for me, it is their foot in the political world that has helped to inspire and motivate the work that I do, um, you know, on the ground daily here. Um, both uh, the reservations and the cities here in South Dakota have um, the data, the disproportionality and all those euphemisms for white supremacy that we use. We have that here. 70% of the days uh, in jail are, are, are spent by Native American people here in Pennington County. And uh, that type of oppression um, employs a lot of white people to continue to perpetuate these things against Native Americans. Um, I want to to say that when I was asked to join this panel that I didn't necessarily, uh, you know, I didn't uh, really get automatically why, why I was asked to join. But for me personally, in the work that I do, art has always been alongside the work of community organizing, the work of campaigns and the work of leadership. You know, words are symbols, but art itself is leads. We would not have movement without art. And for me, I think it's really important the role that it plays in terms of being able to grapple with the complexity of our world and also the, co the complexity that America and the United States finds itself today in terms of white supremacy and colonialism. I'm sharing this image um, that was a collage that was created by Ernesto Yerena uh, of, of me. This is my, a photo that was taken by Donnie LeBeau, a photographer from my tribe. And the collage then was uh, created with a number of photos of mine personally in the background. Uh, this photo was taken and I used it in my campaign and when I was running for office. Um, UCLA commissioned this work um, as part of a social justice initiative uh, that was a celebration of 100 years of UCLA. Um, and in particular, they decided to highlight those of us who have been working in social justice um, and who are UCLA alumni. I graduated in 1999 and then again with my law degree in 2007. So I just wanna share that artwork because I think that it can exemplify what uh, can happen um, between art, art activism and our community and fighting against white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Really appreciate those words. And now we're gonna go back to America and I'm gonna pivot to the question of to whom should museums reach out for Native American, Native consultation as they shift, as I yeah, discussed that's earlier. A good question, because um, I think a lot of people are kind of jostling for that role. And um, 
within our communities across the board, for the most part, it's unacceptable to put yourself up. And for some communities, like Hopi communities, it's really not okay to stand up and like be like, me, me, me. You know, self-promotion is frowned upon by most tribal communities. So it's kind of hard that what is expected and needed um, in Western societies um, is, is runs counter to our cultures. So, you know, I personally see my role as I need to advocate for others, like I'm their cheerleader. So the, the people that are ingrained and culturally knowledgeable, the people with the knowledge will often be the people that will not step forward, will not shove their resume in your face or the business card in your face. And um, it's also very interesting because uh, the person who sounds most like the expert tends to be the person who knows the least because um, I think you need to get used to, if you're not already, that um, in tribal communities, we're accountable to a lot of people. So the person who probably will have the most deep knowledge will probably have the most caveats and apologies and be like, well, there's many different viewpoints. This is a viewpoint that I hold and this is why I held it, you know. So that kind of cultural thing. So um, I think it's good to always have a con conversation with many people, you know, vet people, you know, don't just like take anything anyone tells you at face value. Um, definitely talk to other people. But um, luckily in New York City, you have an incredible resource, you know, that's right down the street. I don't know a lot about the Guggenheim because I am totally locked into art by, you know, art by indigenous peoples of the Americas and the Guggenheim really hasn't been engaged. But I, I look forward to what you guys are gonna do in the future. But the American Indian Community House is right there. And um, yes, New York has been historically a homeland of Delaware people, but uh, you know, of course there's many, many tribes represented there and Mohawk people and different Six Nations Haudenosaunee people have had a major impact on the city, not the least of which physically building a lot of the buildings in the city. So there are Haudenosaunee people at a American Indian Community House that you can reach out to, to start accessing the local, um, very intertribal New York City native community. And then the Shinnecock are right there. They're federally recognized. They have a reservation right there, you know. Um, I do wanna say that American Indian Community House, their um, website is aich.org. And then um, when you're looking out, you wanna talk to your local community, but you also, when you're trying to find out about art, you might have an intertribal conversation, but ideally you would want to seek the home community that the artwork comes from. Or if you're discussing an artist, like what community did that artist come from? Um, so basically looking at who the federally recognized tribes are, if you need to find that out, you can punch, this is the easiest way, punch federally recognized tribe and tribal or national register into Google. And that will give you the national register. And then you'll have the exact name of every tribe in the United States and you'll be able to look them up. And thankfully the web, you know, that tribes are being able to publish their own information, it's free. Um, they, you know, almost every tribal website, you know, gives an outline of their own own history as they see it and then you can reach out to them and then you know before I was saying that um, a tribe is something like an amoeba you know that might be the most not the most elegant um, way to phrase it so the core is the speakers the native speakers the medicine makers the ceremonial leaders the elders and as a museum especially an urban museum I would kind of say don't bug those people, that they're busy, they have lives, they have jobs to do. And, you know, often they don't really want to pick up calls and emails. They have other priorities. So there are um, kind of the sweet spot of people that are interested in, you know, from the tribal communities that are interested in engaging with the outside world and that's their role. So the best source there is uh, tribal cultural centers and museums. And thankfully there's more and more. I have such a different relationship with museums. When I hear that museums are colonial institutions, I'm like, what? Because I was raised in um, museums and cultural centers created by native people. And here in Oklahoma, we have the oldest one. We have um, the Osage um, Nation Museum. Wow, I thought I had a lot more time than that. I apologize. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how this is gonna work because I still have images, but, um, but um, so tribal museums, tribal cultural centers, libraries, archives, and then tribal historic preservation officers. So you can just look that up and you'll be able to get that um, online. So 
these people are used to taking outside uh, questions, that that is their job and they are willing to do that. And often just realistically, I know COVID's made everything more complex. Phone calls tend to work better than emails. A lot of people, you know, I think we're all overburdened by random emails and a lot of uh, people at tribal museums might be just overburdened by emails. So a phone call might go a further. And a lot of people um, make big points that, uh, this building up a relationship takes time and really you should consider what long-term relationships you want to invest in. Um, and please don't ever ask um, Native people to write things for you for free. Like they might put you in the right direction, but they're not going to do your job for you for free. You have to, you have to give them compensation. But it's also compensation. It's important to know also that we do have qualified Native Americans in all fields, in the arts fields, art history fields, museum fields. So when people say, oh, there's no qualified Natives, then you're not looking, you need to look harder. Thank you so much, America. And from that nice, quick and, quick and easy way of looking to museums is how they reach out to Native Americans. Um, I, have a, I want to go back to Natalie and ask a question about the role that institutions have currently in the social justice space right now, and what role do you think they should have? Well, I think uh, traditionally white institutions need to take responsibility for where we're at. This isn't just an issue of the police. This isn't just an issue of the courts or the law. Um, and it's not just an issue of, of simple poverty or impoverishment, which is what I like to call it, impoverishment. People are historically deprived of their resources like indigenous people are of our land and our intellectual property. And therefore we are impoverished today. Um, and that makes it difficult to navigate in a capitalistic society. Um, and I think it's important to understand that, you know, reality of that. Um, traditionally, white institutions have, are the result, um, uh, you know, the, the Guggenheim is the result of white supremacy, colonialism, and racism, just as much as um, it is, uh, you know, obligated to fight against those things, so especially today or perhaps in the last, you know, 20 years. Um, and I think, you know, for me, uh, the redistribution of resources is so important for leadership, flag staff, traditionally white institutions to do. Um, we have the Dahl Art Center here, which is sort of our mini little, our little Guggenheim um, for Rapid City and for the Black Hills region. And they still continue to commit egregious acts of racial discrimination, erasure and marginalization of Native Americans, as well as tokenization, whether it's staff or art that they are uh, exhibiting. Now, I don't wanna discount the wonderful work that some people do and are able to do in that space, but I do wanna offer a, a solution in terms of how these institutions need to help dismantle what created, what in itself created it, you know? Um, and a commitment to that is not just a destructive commitment, but rather, a constructive one, a, a creative one, and that is to rebuild and reimagine a, a, a society together uh, that doesn't have to involve exploitation and impoverishment. Um, we have plenty of wealth in our society so that the peasants do not need to starve in the United States. Um, and, you know, here in, 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 in my community in Rapid City, we have the Racing Magpie, which is a studio space and an artist space and a physical space where those of us who are political and concerned about our community can gather. Um, spaces like that, that fuse the community, that bring together the community and that help us to be ourselves as indigenous people in our own homeland and in our territory, that is an important role of art institutions to take. Um, now with COVID-19, we see a reshaping and a reimagining of education and how that should take place. Art artistic institutions need to be a part of that. But I also feel that this elitism, you know, is often um, 
irrelevant to the conditions that natives are facing on streets and on the reservations. Um, you know, in the space of the last month, we've had a numerous incidents of police brutality on the street level, but we also have had newsworthy incidents where protesters on July 3rd who are Lakota are being charged with numerous felonies for simply exercising their free speech rights and basic, basic civil and constitutional rights here in the United States. And we have our local authorities who are bullying and using, as far as I'm concerned, excessive force, um, not physical force, but the force of the courts and the law against our leaders. Um, then you have, in just the last three weeks, a SWAT team was called out for a suicidal Lakota man. He was incinerated in his home. His grandmother needed help with him. He was suicidal, he was in crisis. And the police responded with a SWAT team and a standoff and eventually used projectile devices that we believe were flammable and um, uh, 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 combusted uh, hit the home. So grandmother has lost the life of her grandson. She also lost her home. Um, we have a highway patrol officer who attacked a, a man, a native black indigenous 20 year old with a canine unit. It was in the middle of a video that went viral, um, but no major news except our local news covered it. But he, we, we watch a man be taken down by a canine unit without any call to stop by his handler who was a South Dakota Highway Patrol officer. Um, and then another incident, and this is all just in the last three weeks. This is you know uh, right up the hill from where I live we had a SWAT team called on a 14 year old in a home who was merely a witness to a crime, to a shooting that had taken place. Concurrent to this, we have a number of like homicides going on. And so this re very real stuff is often, you know, it's too bloody, it's, it's too, it's too, it's too, it's, too, it's the streets, it's rough, it's violent. Um, but we need our institutions to respond and be socially responsible to when these things are taking place in your own community. Um, not to disengage from that to, and not to disengage from the pain and the trauma that those of us who are the victims of this are experiencing both as individuals and as communities. Um, <clears throat> so I, I believe that a place like Racing Magpie has helped us here in Rapid City to navigate and survive here uh, with these type of incidents happening um, on the streets and in the neighborhoods. And I don't know where my time is at, Jody, but I'll, I'll leave it there. That's great. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Um, really appreciate the honesty and the candor of what's happening in Rapid City and what your, you and the community are having to respond and deal with and how, how institutions can be of service and how they can also um, turn a blind eye. With that, I'm going to turn the the a question back to Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, uh, would you address reckoning in the current context of activism, activism and social racial justice actions, often described as either authentic or performative? Might be on mute. I, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, I wanted to introduce you all to my grandmother um, by way of answering that. This is Richinda Aspinall Davis Eads, and she is, helped raise me in El Reno, Oklahoma. And this is her sly way of being performative and being an advocate for Cheyenne ways. We call the moon our grandmother. And she, all her grandchildren would call her when we saw this photo, Grandma Moon. And she would say, no, that's a picture of Grandma Moon. 
that's not a picture of the moon, our grandmother. So she was teaching us at the same time that she was being performative, if you will. What I think the lesson is about what's happening today, um, and I'd like to see the next slide, please. What's happening today, uh, this is not today, this is 1969, and this is a group of young Native people who lived in New York City, and it includes people who in that year improved the Columbus statue in Central Park and the Teddy Roosevelt statue with one black man on one side of Teddy Roosevelt on his high horse and a native man on the other side and you barely see them and then you have the horse looking very distressed uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, a supremacist kind of statue. It's a statue for racism. It's a lot of things that we don't want to be thought of or to be. And some of the people in this, um, in this group set the stage for everyone else in 1969 when they splashed paint on it. And what better way to deal with a racist than to approximate blood dripping from it because that's what happens. That's what happened with, with, with Jacob Blake, say his name. That's what's happened to Breonna Taylor, say her name. That's what happened to so many of our people that most of us cannot even say their names. So I appreciate Black Lives Matter for giving us that lesson and also for helping us with this statue. And I so appreciate too, the people at the Natural History Museum, the American Museum of Natural History in New York the one with the great dinosaurs and all of that you used to have the Indians next to the dinosaurs. And that's, we have a whole new museum because a lot of us didn't like that kind of presentation and wanted to get out of the flora and the fauna and to be humanized and not objectified. So we built our own museum and I'm proud to have been one of the founders of the American Mu of the National Museum of the American Indian uh, which is in the Smithsonian Institution. Um, the Black Lives Matter together with the see the red banner what they chose to do was put a parachute over the statue and then to put a, a banner around it which I think is an um, an even better commentary on it. They did that in cooperation with, uh, with several groups, including Stand with Standing Rock, uh, where Jody Archambault was from, and without which a lot of people might not realize there, were, there are still Native people living today. Uh, we run into people all the time who don't know that we're still alive as a people and think we're only anomalies uh, in the present era. The Natural History Museum, and I have to name my good friend, David Hurst Thomas, took heed of the protest. It took him a long time, but that's okay. These things take time. And shortly after this last demonstration, so you go from 1969 to 71 to 2017, and now in 2020, um, after this demonstration with the parachute and the red banners, they decided to move the statue. Well, that's the right thing to do take it away if it offends so many people. 
all across the board, take it away, take heed of that. And they had taken heed before and recontextualized uh, the in a small, small exhibit, the statue inside. But now they're going to have a chance to, to look at it. I want these statues preserved. I'm not for destroying them. I want them inside the museums. I want them as evidence because we're going to need them to show people how bad they were. I don't want the racist books to be burned. I don't want the statues to be burned. I want them all preserved as evidence. They're going to be our hard, good friends. So I thank everyone for inviting us here today, for being so gracious in your hosting and um, make art people. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And uh, for our final panelists, we have Edgar Heap of Birds, and we're going to go a little bit over time because we're, we're just really thrilled that he's able to join us right now. And I'm just going to turn it over for remarks to Edgar. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, can I have the first image, please? The uh, monoprint. Yeah, this is from uh, the, the project called Places of Healing. And uh, it's a large monoprint installation. These are our sites of sacred worship and renewal. Uh, the first one is uh, Nuwus, which is in South Dakota. Also Alaska is represented and also Hawaii. Can we have the next slide, please? The next uh, image is going to be the, the full installation. It's uh, 528 inches by 90 inches. Uh, 2020 is when it was created. And there are monoprints. Uh, the left side is the uh, primary print and the right side is the uh, ghost print, which is the second pool. And it's always a fainter print. And it's kind of my metaphor for how natives are kind of not seen very clearly in this country. So I always pull a ghost print. Okay, next please. These are all uh, sites and sacred sites in, in the Americas. And the next slide. Uh, so there's a primary prints from uh, Places of Healing. Uh, and they're all, all, as I said, they're all sites for worship and renewal. Uh, Concha was also uh, pictured there, which is where we have our ceremony in Oklahoma. Okay, next slide, please. And that's the ghost prints, again, representing how natives are really underappreciated, under, uh, not really understood very well. So there's a fainter kind of image. Okay, next, please. Uh, this next uh, image is, uh, is a picture of the piece called Health of the People's the Highest Law. And I find that museums need to have three particular uh, interests in their programming. One is uh, the, the issues for communities, which is the first print I showed you. The second is the health of the people, the spirit of the society, the health. And these are all issues of, of uh, health on my reservation and my family. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a sudden loss. So we have a lot of death on the reservation from a lot of uh, issues that happen with health and, and history. So there's a lot of uh, loss that happens. These are all done way before the pandemic as well. Okay, next please. And, and those again are the primary prints. Uh, these are prints that are the first pull from the plate. They're 22 by 30 inches. And uh, this is the same size as 528 by 90. And these are all done uh, in my studio that I have in Santa Fe and also in Oklahoma. Okay, next please. The next slide is the ghost prints. And, and my studio in Oklahoma is very near Concho. And I have an independent studio. I'm not represented by a gallery. So I work all this work out of my own, my own studio in Oklahoma. Okay, next please. This is the newest uh, project. It's called Water is Your Only Medicine. You see that in the, in the far left. And this piece is done about another uh, issue of the museums could have, and that is to protect the natural world. And so these are all uh, images about uh, the preciousness of water and how important it is for everyone. And again, on the left is the primary prints, on the right is the ghost prints. Okay, next please. Uh, blood plasma uh, certainly is, is made up mostly of water and mop, mop is water in Cheyenne language. Okay, next please. Uh, the next image is the primary prints. Uh, this is a water's only medicine. And again, it's about 500 inches by 90. Uh, next, please. 
and those are the ghost prints. And in some cases, they're they're kind of buffed out from the second pull. There's not enough ink to pull to make the whole image. But it's a it's a fitting metaphor for how hard it is to be a native person in this country, how faint we are really in society's memory. Next slide, please. And that's the image uh, in a museum space as well. So I show them in corners or in a long row of, uh, of kind of demarcation. And so there's a series of these major projects and the Museum of Modern Art has collected one as well. So they're, they're in New York and they're around the world. And uh, those are my works today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar, for your beautiful, beautiful work and conceptualization of, I think, what the panelists here today have been expressing uh, throughout their remarks. Um, what I'm just going to leave everybody here today with an understanding that what we need in society is a shift in values. It's a shift in values that Indigenous peoples have been praying for since contact. And that's a shift to the sacred, to understand really what the sacred means, what, what is important and valuable. And our original teachings and our instructions from our ancestors and the spirit beings are such that we understand that the things, the way the world is going is that the opposite of the opposite of what we've been taught is what is valued. Money has to come from someplace where there's extraction and some degree of theft, some degree of enslavement of the human spirit, of the natural spirit, a discarding of life and energy in a way that will make accumulation possible. And it's a false sense of what the reality is because the mother earth of Unchimaka will not sustain in those circumstances. And we see a lot of the eruptions across the country right now that are moving further and further away from that sanctity and that peace that we get from mother earth and nature and water. And we know that there's healing there. We also know that these instructions are not found in places of great prestige and institution. They're found with the people of the indigenous nations throughout Turtle Island. And I just really thank every single person who made this panel possible. I thank everybody who contributed, in especially the, the panelists who brought you their stories, their heart, and shared their lessons. And we hope that with this conversation begins a new day where we aren't just talking about words, that there is an actual reckoning. Thank you. Wopilat Hanka.